having those veterans that genuinely care about you as a person, but that's and team success, it, it changed my career. I could have easily kind of gone off a different path, darker path, if it wasn't for Kemba Walker. Welcome to the CJ McCollum Show, joined by special guest Grant Williams with Izzy Gutierrez. As always, I am recording this podcast as of Tuesday the 28th before we fly to Portland, Oregon to play against the Portland Trailblazers. But before we get into all that stuff, I want to welcome the man who was selected with the 22nd overall pick in 2019 draft by the Celtics. I'm going to read some college accolades because he so kindly reminded me that he had a better college career than me over All-Star break. Consensus first team All-American, two-time SEC Player of the Year, SEC Player of the Year AP 2019, two-time first team All-SEC 18-19, SEC All-Freshman team, um, led the Tennessee Volunteers to a third seed in 18 and a second seed in, in 19. Um, Grant Williams from the Boston Celtics uh, having another tremendous year alongside one of the best teams in the NBA. I appreciate you joining the podcast. How you doing? I'm doing good, brother. I'm happy that you remembered that, you know, Lehigh didn't have the same uh, trajectory as Tennessee back then, but uh, I'm feeling pretty good. Just got back from uh, New York last night late, so excited to get on the pod. Thanks for having me. As a Florida guy, um, gave us nightmares. I mean, I don't know how good the Florida team was when you were there, but still, um, back-to-back SEC player of the year is the first player to do that since Corliss Williamson, and the reason I love Corliss Williamson bringing him up is because such a good player, but he has such a terrible nickname because his name's rhyme was scoreless. So his name was scoreless Corliss Williamson, oh, <laughs> but he was a two-time <laughs> SEC player of the year. But anyway, uh, Grant, thanks for giving the Gators nightmares. Hey, listen, I remember I did the Gator chomp one time and the SID uh, ran into me and bumped me after the game because it was a whole contentious game at, at Florida. That was one of my favorite moments of my Tennessee career. So <laughs> good vibes. <laughs> Let's talk about your journey to the NBA first and foremost and, and what it's kind of been like for you throughout your career. Obviously, you get drafted, you know, kind of in the rotation, not playing a lot of minutes. And then as your career has kind of progressed, you've played starters minutes, you've started games, you've gone to the finals. How has your journey kind of transformed into where you are today? And then for kids out there that are trying to figure out how to carve out a role, right? I think that's the important part of, you know, what we all kind of go through is, you're a star in college, then you go to the NBA and you have to figure out a role to be successful for your team, but also for yourself. Absolutely. So I've always been huge on maximizing the role that is is available for you. Um, in high school, I wasn't necessarily high major crew, as you both we both know. Uh, I chose Tennessee. My only other offers were like Yale, Princeton, Harvard, Richmond, and those guys. And I look back and I think it really prepared me for what I faced in the league because coming into the league that rookie year, I was in the rotation but at the same time, like not fully trusted yet. Went to the playoffs, thought I had played a great, great playoffs. We ended up losing the Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, following year, I was out out of the rotation, really. Um, same thing, in and out, boom, boom, boom. And then th we had the coaching change. We had a bad second year, third year. Uh, Eme came in and same thing. I had to prove myself to him. Got back, got fully in the rotation. We went to the finals, ended up losing the finals. And similar situation this year, honestly. So it's just a matter of you always have to be prepared for whatever's coming your way. And to always give the advice that we can't control the situations we're going to be in. We can control the reactions we have. And we can always control the effort and the intensity that we play with. So for me, it was always about um, just continually improving, whether that was on the court, off the floor. And I... Fortunately enough, like really took growth in many different areas of my game, whether it was three-point shooting, whether it was defensively, and got a nice um, reputation across the league as not only a talented player, but a good person. And that's something that I always tried to drive myself to, because if you're genuine and then you play with the ultimate goal in mind, whether that's winning and make sure your team success, no matter if you're scoring 20 points or two points, then you have success in whatever place you play, whether that's college, high school, or even in the league. And I've always told people that you don't have to necessarily be the leading scorer to be one of the best players. And that's kind of how I've viewed my entire career to this point. Because even at Tennessee, when I was doing all those cool things, I remember all these guys were averaging 20 plus in college. And I was only averaging, I think, 18 my senior year, or maybe even less than that years before that. So 
it's all about maximizing the role that's presented and understanding that that might not be your role the following season. You can place yourself out of that role just by your improvement and focus on year over year, not looking 10 years down the line. So Grant, there's one specific element of your sort of upbringing in, in basketball or sports period that I'm curious with, because there's guys that come into the league that have to fill out. And then there's guys like yourself, and there's not many of them that look like they're taking a break from the NFL to play some NBA. Uh, <laughs> when, and I'm looking at, I looked at pictures of like you in college and it's just, I mean, it's the same. It's just ripped and giants. Like what point did that like just element of weightlifting and just uh, physical preparation um, start becoming an element of your getting ready for whatever, you know, wherever basketball was going to take you. I was always you've got, uh, you got some professional players in your family. So you kind of know a lot of that. And you're also kind of built this way, right? <laughs> yeah. Fortunately enough, I was uh, not built like my cousins in the, in the past, like Salim and Damon, those guys who were skinny. I was the chubby kid growing up. So it was easier for me to be strong and be roly poly than it was for me to be agile and mobile. So when I got to college, actually, that's when it truly hit me is that I walked in because at high school, I wasn't necessarily uh, looked at as a, like an elite athlete and stuff like that. And Rick Barnes came up to me and he said, you're going to have to take care of yourself, take care of your body in order to be maximized the player you're going to be. And that's what my first summer was. I remember I came into college at like 280 plus pounds, probably, and ended up going all the way down to 225 that summer. Hmm. And... Wow. After and I built it back up, um, got up to like two thirty five. I was my playing weight most of my college career, and I remember just feeling so much better. He used to make fun of me, Coach Barnes, because um, I had two funny stories. The first being uh, when I first got to school, my mom bought like e like sent me a package, and in that package was just bags of buttered popcorn. It was literally just like like imagine just over Rittenbacher took it off the box. And just dumped in in a big You're like why is this box so light? Yes, <laughs> it's just full of uh, popcorn. And I was running on the treadmill one time. Rick Barnes walks in with a bag of cooked popcorn. It's like, hey, how you doing, Grant? And just like talking trash to me while I'm running with uh, the popcorn in his hand. And then the second being that I remember having to lose that weight, and like my strength. I give credit to my strength coach Gary Maidenwald all the time because he changed my mentality when it comes to just my approach in basketball and life. And he always said, it's not a habit. It's not a diet. It's not something that you will say. It has to be a lifestyle. And it's kind of like how I've really approached it moving forward is that in order for me to be the best player I can be and also feel the best I can, I have to take care of myself and make sure that I can move. And in the league, I had to gain more weight because guarding guys like Giannis and Bede and those guys, and also being able to guard, guard guys like CJ, who gives me a fit every every other time we play them. Um, it's just like, you have to be able to do it all. So I remember having to put on weight, but also maintain the idea of saying like, you have to be heavy, but not um, heavy enough where you can't move. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good balance. And I think a lot of us have gone through that, you know, in college, obviously I was the opposite, right? I was super small. I was very skinny. When I got to campus, I was, yeah, yeah that's what they say. I was 153 pounds. I played my freshman year at 165. And when I left, I was 197. So I had a good amount of time where I gained weight and I kind of lifted and got stronger. And then you get to the league and you think that you have to be heavy. And in reality, you need to be strong, but lean. Cause like you said before, you got to be able to move. And if you're a guard, you got to be strong enough to guard big wings, quick enough to get around small guards. And it's like this balance of, you know, where do I find like my happy medium for my body and overall feeling. But I, th I think the, the cool part, like you said before, is you went to college, you kind of learned, you understood the importance of taking care of your body, nutrition, not eating popcorn all the time. And if you are going to eat popcorn, you got to exercise a little bit more. I think a lot of athletes think you have to be heavy. And it's like, no, you just need to be strong. You need to be right. strong, but you need to be mobile. And I think that's an important tool that I'm teaching <clears throat> my little cousin is he thinks he needs to weigh a lot. I'm like, you don't need to weigh a lot. Work on your core, work on your strength, and you'll gain weight as you get older. And I think that's a really cool um situation because it, it it there's parallels between guards and bigs in that in that light. Right. You've played 61 games this year. There's a lot of conversations about uh, load management, things of that nature. And I won't really get into that right now because I don't think that's the it's the right time per se. But you talked about improving your three-point percentage. 
How has the Celtics offense helped empower you to shoot more threes is the first question. And what's Joe Mazzula like as a coach? Yeah, so the Celtics, um, even from the beginning, I remember my rookie year, they encouraged me to shoot, even though I had never really shot my career since high school. I was, I think, a 38-plus three-point shooter at EYBL. Got to college and took probably less threes than I took my whole life in those three years. So then next, so when I got to the Celtics, them telling me to shoot, 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 I was like, I, I don't know what this is like. And that first stretch of I went 0 for 25 to start uh, my career. And I was like, gosh, I'm not this bad of a shooter. And from then on, after I started making shots, I shot like 40 plus percent since then. So um, the offense itself, it empowers us to just space the floor. Um, each one of us creates for one another, whether it's dribble drives, whether it's hitting under and rolling, whether it's um, just isolation and for getting creating a mismatch and kicking out the shooters. So it empowers me to not only take the shots, but it actually encourages me to shoot more. I don't understand it because I've never been a guy that's like, I've never shot contested threes. I've never been a guy that shoot. I've always been the guy that gets the next play action, but according, that's a great shot now. So um, that's something that I have to work on and focus more on is just knocking down shots from deeper ranges, but also with contested shots that are good shots that the team won't get mad at me for. And then in terms of Joe Missoula, he's like the most even keeled uh, nutball you'll ever meet. Uh, mm. He's a great guy. <laughs> He's honest. He's uh, to the point. Uh, great relationship with players, but he's like one of those guys that you can tell he's that like, calm and his demeanor and everything like that. But then all of a sudden, if you flip the switch, he could really go to it. And you got to love him for that because he's an ultimate competitor. He's a guy that will always challenge you to be like stronger, tougher, like not play soft. And he's also the guy that's going to be there for you if you're going through it. So that's why I think his balance uh, as a coach is so unique because he's such a just a genuine person and he cares about those around him and he cares about the success of the team and I'm fortunate enough to say that uh, my personal relationship with him is already there and I'm just thankful to be able to look at him in his eyes and understand that he wants the best for me but also wants the best for every every person around me when you talk about the uh the three-point shooting and like not uh expecting that level of encouragement or, or wanting you to shoot that um, how much do you look at like Al Horford and just say, man, like that guy is an inspiration in terms of uh, expanding your game and just becoming an entirely different player than I think than not, I think than, than he was when he entered the league? Yeah, it's crazy to me when I look at Al just in his career because he played with my cousin actually in, in Atlanta his rookie year. My cousin was his vet, Salim Sotomayor. So I always laugh. I'm like, that you're old, man. Salim was playing when you were playing. <laughs> you're an old guy. And I asked him about it all the time, like, how did he just change? Because he went from a guy that I was having to bang with fives every five seconds of the day to then spacing the floor, shooting threes at the four for us. And he said, it's just like he really dove into the whole, you have to expand your game in order to stay in this league. Because he was always a really solid defender. But the way the league was was changing, it changed to shoot more threes. He said, I have to be able to adapt and do that. So he really put time in and worked on just not his jumper, but also just his ability to play on the perimeter, be comfortable facing the basket rather than his back to the basket. And he's one of the most professional guys you'll ever meet. He takes care of his body better than anyone I've probably met, just in the sense of like he makes sure that every single day he does the things he needs to do just to be able to play. Being, what, 36, 37 years old now, like he's maximizing. Wait, that's it? I yeah. swear he was like 42 at this point. <laughs> I would have thought so too. I would have thought so. I thought he was like 50 when I first met him. When he cut his hair and everything else, I was like, you got five kids too? Goodness. <laughs> but um, he's uh, cut his hair. I mean, he did a great job of just making sure that he took care of himself and his body and his work. And he comes in every day with the right approach. He comes in every day leading us, honestly, because when I first got to the league, I had to look to veterans like Kimball Walker and those guys, and they did a phenomenal job of teaching me. And now I learn even more from Al being 36 and seeing what it might be like, hopefully in the back half of my career, to be able to continue playing in this league. You know, it's crazy intriguing to me about guys like you and CJ. And um, so you've got what uh, was it three years in college or three years? You got your business degree, right? At, yes. And so the the level of effort and, you know, just work that it takes to become a professional athlete, like 
And you've still got a business degree in your back pocket. You've still got, I'm sure it's, and like, you know, CJ's got a winery and stuff like all these other things that you're doing also on top of, um, of being an NBA player, like in your mind, uh, what was your sort of projected, you know, life or your path and like how much of that business degree was just like, I could pretty much do anything. Yeah. What's crazy is I honestly never really thought I was going to be playing in the league originally. I was something I dreamt of. But for, as a kid, you know, like you playing against all these guys in North Carolina, you have the Dennis Smith Juniors, the Harry Giles, the Bam Data Bios. Those were just my class alone. And at first I was like, oh, dang, like I'm not rated. I'm not ranked. I'm not like one of those guys that people pay attention to. And I'll always compete against those guys. So I was like, hmm, maybe I can play in college at least. Maybe I can compete. And so when I get to college, I when I get on the freshman team, I get back to that that summer. And I was taking so many course credits because I wanted to graduate in three years because I promised my mom because I didn't go to Ivy Leagues that I would graduate in three years. And then if I didn't get my my go go to the league after my third year, I would come back and get my master's. And Rick Barnes walks up to me and says, hey, Grant, you want to work as hard as you can this summer because you're going to be the SEC player of the year if you do that. And I remember those words like it was yesterday and I just went to work. And, and then when the SEC player year that year, my second year and then third year as well, and graduated after taking 19 hours of my junior year, uh, both semesters, and took the draft process. I didn't even think I was going to go into the draft that year. I remember looking back, and I was debating going back to school. If it wasn't for, like, sitting down conversations with my family, with my, like, the agents, and also myself, just, like, thinking about it, like, what more could I have done in college? I realized that, all right, maybe I should take this step. And I went to the league, and it's worked out so far. So uh, in terms of life path, like, I would have never even guessed – like my career or my life has gone this way, but I wanted to make sure that even if I didn't have the success that I had in basketball, that I was prepared to attack life and make the situation and life better from the people around me and the people I love. Like family's big and big to me. And I wanted to make sure like, even if I'm not an MBA, able to take care of my mom, my grandparents, my brothers, I'm going to put myself in a similar position where now the same network, the same ability to give back, I want to be able to do all that. You discuss not thinking that the NBA was a possibility early on in your career. You're born in Houston, Texas. You know, you went to school in Carolina, you ended up going to school in Tennessee. Is the NBA what you thought it would be? This is a question I like to ask players a lot because we have this idea of what we think it's going to be like, and then we get there. Is it what you thought it would be? Not as much as I would have would liked. I would say that it definitely like altered my perception of the league and the players and also the, the environment that we have to play in. Because I was like, you always think as a kid that the league is going to be perfect. Like there's nothing wrong. You're living the perfect life and everything like that. And you realize how isolating that the league can be and like you can be lonely and you have to make sure that you find things that keep you happy as well as making sure that you understand that like you're not, if you're not the superstar player, similar to how it was is in, like growing up in high school and in college, you have to be prepared to go through things that others may not have to go through. And those are all the things that as a kid, you don't think about. You think that once once you get to the league, you're going to be making a lot of money. You're going to be able to travel. You're going to be able to like play. And and you realize that all that stuff has to be earned and worked for. And also you have to realize that not everything in the league is things you can control. Sometimes a guy might have a $16 million contract, so he has to play over you. So there might be times where guys like, they're trying to see if this guy's for our future. Or this guy can't even play for this year. And there, I remember there was one time where I wasn't playing and I was like, what the heck is going on? Like I'm calling my agent. Like I was debating whether or not to be traded. And end of the year, I realized that the whole time that they played that guy in the first half of the season, they were trying to trade him. And so it wasn't anything I was doing. It was more so like, we were just trying to make sure we can maximize our value for this player. And I'm like, well, why don't you just tell me that, you know, rather than like, just doing this and I'm thinking I'm the one that's the issue, but like you can't control what you half the things that are going down in the league. You look at the guys across the league, even Matisse Thibault, I look back to in Philadelphia, like this year is a rich free agency. He's over here playing the past three years and all of a sudden he's not t- touching the floor. I'm like, how why is that the case? And it's like, maybe they're minimizing that value. He ended up getting the trade and now he's thriving in Portland. So it's kind of crazy to me. Uh, when you think about all that, you don't realize that as a kid. You just think, like, oh, this guy got traded. This guy just happened. Like, this is this. He's got left a free agent. But you never really know why or the factors. CJ, tell him the tips on how to stay informed so you're not surprised. 
Um, follow just, Woj. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I, I I follow. Uh, I got drafted by Woj. I didn't get drafted by Adam Silver. I got drafted. And I figured out. <laughs> my friends text me saying, uh, "Congratulations!" And I'm over here like, "How did what? Congratulations for what?" And Woj was the one that tweeted, or Woj and Shams were the ones that tweeted my uh my my pick. You know, uh, Grant, it's funny you have that perspective. Like it's it's great sort of recognizing that it can be lonely, right? Because a lot of people, even your age, what are you still 24? Yeah. Um, maybe haven't literally lived long enough to recognize, man, like this is lonely. Like the past three or four years have probably been lonely for people. And so to recognize that and recognize that you need to do something about it for your own, you know, mental health and your own uh, just daily, you know, upbeatness. Uh, what have you found that makes you happy? And when did you realize that you had to just find something that, hey, this isn't, you know, all it's cracked up to be? Absolutely. I actually realized that, like, not only gaming, but also just, like, my ability to, like, disconnect a little bit. Because I've always been a person that I'm go, 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 go. I don't really, like, when, when I do relax, I'm not doing anything. So, like, finding that balance of saying, like, you don't have to be on go all times but you can't just be laying in bed 24 hours of the day because that can be depressing. So like, mm -hmm. I was like, all right, cool. So like I found, like, I enjoy golf. I enjoy like, like fortunately enough, my brother and my friend Parker live with me now. And I remember when they first moved in, we play cards or any type of board game every single night. We legit after games, we get back after a win or a loss. We don't have to say anything about basketball. We just enjoy that time with one another. I learned how like I picked up chess again because Chess was something that I grew up playing as a kid from my with my grandparents and um and chess club and everything like that. And I drew, like drove to hate it because I was like, oh, I don't want to have to do this and stuff like that. And you realize how um simple not simple, but how complex the game is and how peaceful the game is. You can focus on just honestly moving the piece on the board. Similar to that with music. I realized that I played piano growing up. I was like, you know, I'll pick up the keyboard again. And, and just little things like that and finding things that you not only pass the time, but that you enjoy. And that you can um, really just be happy and realize that people are going through the similar same things as you and figuring out what makes you happy is going to be huge. And I figured that out just by, by experimenting. I had to, it took me a year and a half, two years just to realize um, what are the things that make me smile. And it's both making other people happy and then doing things like games that really keep me in a great mood. Gaming with video games, car games, board games. Sheesh, I bought a game that I went to a uh, Knights Moves Cafe here in Boston. It's a game shop, and it's a game called Crooked Deal. And it's literally just flicking a piece and trying to get it inside the center. And it's like it's it's a, it's a fun game. It sounds you know, amazing. Like you gotta just find things that you enjoy. What'd you think of that chess controversy from a few months back? Do you remember that one? Oh yeah, with Magnus and uh, the dude, the dude that the vibrating <laughs> anal beads supposedly. Yeah, it's vibrating anal beads. I don't, I don't know if I necessarily believe that. Doesn't sound calming to me. That game. Yes, I don't think he can just <laughs> sit there naturally and just be like, "Yeah, I'm good to go." If he can. Props to him, but I, I'm not, I'm not the one to experiment that with. <laughs> I got a question <laughs> in regards to. <laughs> That's good. That is, that is hilarious. I got a question in regards to how the league is getting younger and younger. And you talked about not playing. I didn't play uh, early on in my career and it was frustrating for me and having older vets who actually cared about you was very helpful for my development because they'd have those conversations of like, you know, this is what's happening right now. Like stay professional, do these things. As our league gets younger and younger, how important is it to have good vets, you know, still in the league, still around as I see, potential changes that could happen with the league, but also just how from an age standpoint, there's a lot of one and done. The league is very 19 to 25 right now. Absolutely. It's vital. Um, having those veterans that genuinely care about you as a person, but as a team success, it, it changed my career. I could have easily kind of gone off a different path, darker path. If it wasn't for Kemba Walker, I legit, it's my first year I came into the league and was in and out of rotation after playing and being all American, all that jazz. And you look at it, you're like, I don't know what to do. And I used to have just sit down conversations with Kemba. And he was in the same position group as me. And he just was my OG. He's one of those guys that even when, when COVID happened, I didn't want to go home. I had 87, 84-year-old grandparents at the time. And I was like, I don't want to get them sick. I don't know where I've been. I don't know what to do. And he invited me to live with him the entire COVID period. And to think that you had somebody genuinely care about you enough to allow you not only to live with them, but also train with them and just understand their approach every single day. Like I will always be in debt to 
Kemba Walker just because he's helped my mental and he's helped my my life. And he's been there for me like a brother since I was a rookie, even before that. And he's just a genuine human being. And like it's one of those things that you have those vets that will always be there for you throughout your career, but also after. I can call him today, even though he's not necessarily currently on the team. I can call him today; he'll be there for me. And I think that's so so vital to these young players. Because young players, when they're with one another, they can enjoy each other, hang out, play video games, you know, go out together. But they're not really thinking about what's happening ten years down the line, and they don't really know what to expect. Similar to how, like, you never know. You, I, I still call all of my former teammates that I used to play with because, like, a lot. I'm the last guy in my rookie class of my team. Like, I remember we came in with five or six. It was me, Taco, Tremont, Carson, Romeo, and I'm the only one left. Some guys are overseas. Some guys are on different teams. So I literally have to make sure to call them and be like, hey, man, I'm just thinking about you. I'm here for you. And if you ever need anything, I know it can be tough over there not being here with family and stuff like that or missing the NBA and just know whatever I could do, I'm there. And that goes a long way, but not everyone thinks that way. So having those veterans that genuinely – are there for their teammates and genuinely are there to help the young guys succeed, even if they're playing or not playing. I think it's so, so vital and so important because I know what it was like for me. Speaking of your dogs, CJ, it's the first time we heard your dog on the show. What's that? First time I've seen him on the show. What's uh, or he or she's name? What's the dog's name? Fiona. And before I move this camera over here and show you her, <laughs> um, I just want to preface that pictures have begun to, to be, be hung. Oh, wow. <laughs> See, I mean, it's been <laughs> grand. It was supposed to be the first episode that he was supposed to have pictures. Hung. They've been sitting on the ground forever. He's got multiple interior decorators, plural, <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing on the walls. It sounds so, hilarious. But these these uh, plaques behind me are going on a on a bookshelf. There's going to be a bookshelf behind me that is getting installed soon. So that's why that's not hung. So I do not, have an excuse. The one that's going to like go to the cart, like the shop and make it yourself. No, 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 no. I don't, I'm not very handy. I was, I was taught how to provide. Um, that, that was the teaching. That was same here, man. Don't, don't worry, my mom, I think, hung up all my pictures in here. So uh, let's just say the same. Great. You yeah. mentioned those vets that, that'll help you through. Um, then you got the vets that'll help you in a different way. And I don't know um, if you listen to the pod, probably not. There's a lot for you to do. Um, but we kind of, you know, broke down a video of CJ maybe – sort of putting you on skates during a game in Boston. Wow. <laughs> and wow. Very, we were all very proud of, of CJ. And he was talking, I don't know if you remember that one, uh, but you also mentioned where CJ and Chris Middleton, this is in the past, CJ and Chris Middleton are guys that early on in your NBA career is like, man, I, I got to defend. This isn't college anymore. So I'm curious uh, what CJ's role in that was. And then if you remember that play and and what you guys were chirping about. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sick that CJ brought that on the pod. I thought we were better than that. See? Ah, it was my fault. I brought it up. I saw the clip and I wanted to talk about it. <laughs> I just do what I'm told, man. <laughs> I legit, when I first got to the league, I don't think, I think Chris Middleton scored on me 95% of the possessions that, <laughs> I guard him, and then CJ, I think it was probably at a 92% clip. And he would always just dribble down to the freaking right baseline uh, on the, or on the right, right side and just freaking tween cross, tween cross, sidestep, pull, mid-range, or step back three. And I was like, all right, so how the heck am I supposed to guard this dude? And then there was one year he wasn't shooting great, so I was feeling good. You know, I was feeling good. Well, it may not have been me. It just was a bad shooting year. And then this year, I remember because – we're playing the Pelicans and Zion and all those guys are out. So we, you know, we're scout like CJ is going to be going, he's going crazy right now. He's averaging 30, shooting 50% from three, all this other stuff. I'm like, man, CJ ain't doing that no more. I got him. I, I know how to guard him. And I remember we're on the court and this is, I don't know if CJ said this part of the story, but he legit says like, bring his ass, like bring his fat it's called, up here. And I was like, man, you never know who you're talking to. Like, I do this, see? And all of a sudden, so I'm talking trash, trying my best to, like, you know, psych him out. And he's like, all right. And then that exact possession was the possession we're referring to. And I'm like, all right, cool. Like, I stopped him, cut him off once. Boom, good. Cut him off twice. Boom, good. And all you see is boom, boom, boom. And I am at the free throw line, like, okay. Hopefully he missed this. <laughs> Like I'm like I'm like he's gonna miss, you know. Like I played solid defense. I had two two cut him off, and so I'm a contestant. You know he's gonna miss. Tough and then he catches the shot, and he looks at me in my eyes, 
And you know how that, like, that instant, like, I want to fight you, like, happens? Like, that, like, I'm mad because I know you. And, like, the fact you just talk trash to me and then hit the shot makes you even more mad. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what was going through my mind. Let's just say he tried it again that game and didn't happen the same. But that possession being – I didn't able, find that clip. Yeah, you didn't <laughs> find that clip. But I remember uh, that that possession, I remember being so mad. Running down the court, all I could do was smile. Like, you, if you watch the rest of the clip – I run him the court and said, that's tough, CJ. And he just looks at me and then, like, kind of runs to his matchup because, you know, he can't guard a big guy like me. Um, <laughs> so, like, that was the funniest thing to me is that, like, yeah, CJ, CJ has, has, my, has my number. Let's just say hopefully I get a chance to give, get him back one day. Well, hopefully we meet in the finals, but we got some work to do. So we both um, kind of lose, losing tear as well. So we got some work to do. Let's discuss the Celtics for a second here. You get drafted to Boston. First year, you go to the conference finals. Last year, you went to the finals. What was your finals experience like? And what did you guys learn as a team from that finals experience that you carried it over to this year? Because, you know, last year with MA, you guys got off to a slow start. You were basically 500, you know, at the All Star break. 25 and 27, I think it was. Under I'll go ahead and say I was one of those people on TV saying you got to break that that core up last January. <laughs> I was one of them. But hey, was a lot of people agreeing with me. So I felt like I was smart. Hey, listen, sometimes you have to prove people wrong, but I remember. That that run, that finals run, really taught you a lot because I really think that our lack of discipline caught up to us. You know, we were a talented team. We had a great unit, and we did things the right way, but we also didn't always commit to playing the right way of basketball. And also we didn't commit to coming in with the right mentality each game because we played a talented Brooklyn Nets team, and if you ask any of us, that was going to be the team that, team that we took to seven. And we ended up sweeping them. And so that following series, we played Milwaukee. And we're like, okay, like, boom, we got to play against Giannis and you know, all stuff, but we're going to be good. And we go to four games, we're two and two. And you get to that game five. And rather than approaching it the right way, we ended up losing. And we have to make it so much tougher. If you look at the Warriors, schedule they went four i think four one four two four one or something like that and so we went to seven games with them and then the miami series we were that's i i still look back i'm like we should have swept them or at least one at five and the first game we our first couple games we didn't only lost two quarters we lost two of the games that is absurd to think about like they beat us that badly in two quarters that they ended up winning. We were up by 12 both times, and then they ended up going, beating us by like 24 points or 30 points in one quarter. And that was because we just under, I just un, not only underestimated them, but they outplayed us. They played harder. And so then we get to this, play, this finals, and you assume that you're going to play a talented Warren team that we had success against and won. And we get to the finals, and we go up to, two, I think it was 2-1 two, two, or, yeah, 2-1 to go into game four. And we had a chance to go 3-1. We were leading the most of the game. And then Steph goes and beats Steph. And our discipline falls off the wheels. And they end up winning in six because we just didn't commit to playing the right way consistently over and over and over again. They were a talented team, but we felt like we were just as talented. But their difference was anytime things went wrong, they continued playing the right way. They were always a team that, like, they knew what they were trying to accomplish. They knew who was getting the ball. They knew who was taking the shots. And they knew they had to play hard and get rebounds with the physicality for us, we went from the ultimate physical team to then allowing guys like Andrew Wiggins and those guys to crash on us, get rebounds, second chance points, as well as on offense, we stopped moving it. We went to isolation. We went to the team that we were two years or a year prior, right? The start of the season then was during the, the whole rest of the course of the season. So um, that's really the biggest thing we've learned is that the discipline it takes and the, ability to look at one another and say we're going to play the right way over and over and over again no matter if things are going our way or not going our way and sometimes one loss may happen because you're not making shots but at least you gave yourself a chance by continuing to play the right way great not making excuses for your team because this is for all teams that go that deep but when you get that far especially like you know not quite that far but multiple years of deep runs what level of health are you really talking about when you're in the NBA finals? Like compared to that feeling that you and your teammates feel, you know, opening day of training camp. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't say anyone's healthy at that point of the year, but um, especially when you do that multiple times, it definitely kind of can catch up a little bit because I remember 
getting to the finals and I just went from guarding a KD Kyrie to then guard, which is like you're more on the perimeter, there are more jump shots, and you can tell like you got to – and the physicality comes from like guys like Claxton and those guys, Blake Griffin. And in the next key series, you're playing against Milwaukee where you're legit getting an elbow to the face every two seconds. Defensive fouls, not offensive. And you're guarding a, a mammoth as well as guarding guys that are playing the similar, like Bobby Portis is and the Brooke Lopez is in the world who are super physical. And then you play a Miami Heat team who doesn't really sh- like shot threes at that time. But the first year Miami Heat team was the shooting team. This team was like more of a, I'm going to beat you up, barrel you down, and and try my best to win the game by mucking it up. And so you're playing as Jimmy Butler and P.J. Tucker and guys like that where it's like, goodness, just f- over- overly physical game. And then the last series was you're expected to go from playing two physical grilling out series and one like jump shots to nightmare that just moves, just runs and just like plays so unselfishly off the ball and pass, cut, pass, cut. And that's why it makes them so hard to guard. And it was just a a unique experience. Your body at that point is so banged up that you're like, all right, like let me be sure I take care of myself, but you're not going to be a hundred percent. I remember I was dealing with, freaking ankle, knee, elbow. <laughs> I remember I was dealing with a lot then. And to think that you're playing against that team, you can't use any of those excuses and you end up losing. I was so sure y'all were going to win. You, you, me, CJ, both. <laughs> I went on TV saying that you guys can win the series and I had to tell Draymond um, I was wrong after they won the um, finals. But we talked about this. It was a good lesson, like you said before, to, to experience the finals, playing the finals. Great lesson for JB. Great lesson for Jason Tatum, like your staff, because like, now you kind of know how to prepare. And I tell people all the time, the finals is different. The lights are brighter. Obviously, I've never played in it, but I've covered it. And the media attention around it, it's like a circus, man. It's a, it's, it's different than a normal basketball game because of what goes on behind the scenes. And if you've never experienced it, it can be overwhelming and it, it can take away from the game in some aspects, I think. Yeah, it's definitely one of those where you have to be prepared for everything you sign up for. <laughs> like you look, you look at it, and you're like, "Oh, is you just gonna go out there and play basketball games?" Nah, you're having like a freaking two hour media availability. You gotta have practices so Pete Media and international media can shoot, and then you get to the game actually, and like there's fans and it's rowdy and it's something that it's an environment that, luckily for the Celtics, we have a lot of the course of the year, but like to some, it might be something that you never really see. And now it's like you got both both sides. You're you're really it's a really a back and forth. And I'm fortunate to be able to say I played in it, and I fell in love with it. So I want to play in it again. And you get that hunger to be able to either some some get the hunger to say they they did it once and they're happy, and others get the hunger to say I want to be there every year. Yeah, ramping up the stakes. It feels good, like every single level getting there. And then get into the finals and it's all the show. And once you finally get over the fact that it feels like a show and it's basketball again, that's that's when it starts, I mean, getting great because it's the best two teams. Uh, I was curious, though, like um, the start of this season, um, you guys are, you know, at the top of the league running away with things. How long does this season feel? Because it feels like there's like transitions throughout. But then you get to the because right now, like as we're recording this, Milwaukee overtook you for first in the East. And I never thought that would have happened throughout the season. But then as you feel like it's really long, but then down the street, right after the break, boom, it's like a 25 game sprint. And so, like, what do those like different versions or levels, uh, portions of the season feel like? Oh, man, it's a roller coaster. It's a wave because that start of the season, you're so energetic, you're so fresh. You're like, oh, I'm ready to play. And those first 20, 30 games, you're like, all right, great. And that next 20, you're like, goodness, when is All-Star break coming? Because it's gotten to a point where the schedule is just – like, especially if you're on the road most of the beginning of the season, you're like, goodness, I just want to be home on my bed. I want to, like, do something. Like, the Mm -hmm. mental fortitude you have to have to play in the league at a high level, you have to respect the guys that can do that every single night because people always think that everything's roses and peaches. But then you realize that you're going to deal with injuries throughout the course of the year that you have to manage. You're going to have to deal with – just like not being able to see your family and be on the road or doing things. And you're just like, it can drain you in that middle of the season. And then people go to all-star break and you get that week off and you're like, Oh, feel refreshed. You got to make sure you do whatever it takes. So that way you're back having seasons one of your best runs. And like we saw with our team, we started off hot. We started off with a great 
um, composure. We won a lot of games, and we put ourselves in a great position. Then that middle course of the season, after I think January, we haven't necessarily played well, even to today, even to date. And now Milwaukee's overtaken us, and we have to look look in the mirror and realize that, yeah, we have to step our game back up because any any given night anybody can beat you. We saw with the Knicks last night; they just physically outmanned us in that in that regard. So, uh, we have to prepare ourselves for a playoff run that is just as grueling as the first 50 games of the season. So um, it definitely has this, has this roller coaster in its waves, but for us, it's just a matter of making sure that we keep each other level headed and we approach the game itself the right way. What are you most looking forward to this year in the playoffs? Obviously you talked about your path last year. You talked about, who you had to go through to get to the finals. Two guys, Kevin Durant has joined the Western Conference. Kyrie Irving has joined the Western Conference. So you take them. Something tells me you don't have to worry about Brooklyn. <laughs> you guys I'll... probably wouldn't have to play the Bucks until the conference finals since you're one and two. So that leaves Miami, Sixers, might have to run to Peachy Tucker again. What are you most New looking York, forward maybe. to? Yeah, maybe New York. Mom, honestly, my most the matchup I'm looking forward to the most would be Milwaukee, just because I love playing against Giannis, and is and he's just a freaking dog when it comes to an approach every single night. He plays hard, and he's an ultimate competitor. And off the floor, he's a nice guy, and you talk to him. But on the floor, you're going at it head to head. Um, that, and also, if you're not thinking down the line, quote Converse Finals, we got to make it there first. I like the matches we play in the second round because first round we have to play either Miami, probably Atlanta. Um, one of those seven, seven to ten. If we stay in our current position, and the following series may be a Cleveland or maybe a Philadelphia or a um Brooklyn, New York, and all three, all well, two out of those four teams have really given us fits this year: Cleveland and New York. And to play against either one of those teams would be fun, just because they have Cleveland has two dynamic guards as well as skilled bigs, and then New York is just a physically tough team. They're guys that play hard and they play they have two different units. They have a guy a unit that can play super physical and super, super gritty, and then they have a unit that plays super fast and gets up the floor and shoots a lot of three. So um it's an exciting East to play against because it might have been quote the Kevin Durant's and the Kyrie's last year, but this year I feel like it's a very balanced team by team. And you can see that just in our records. And similar to the Western Conference, all of y'all are separated by two games except for Denver at the top of the five. And similar to us, we're separated by, what, two games at the top, and the rest of us are one game apiece. I was going to say it's going to be a dog fight, but then I thought about Nikola Jokic and his arms being scratched up, and it's more like a cat fight out in the, yeah. in the West. But uh, I, I don't. this is the last thing for me. This is uh, I don't want to get into the East of the playoffs yet because it's going to be a dog fight. But we can't go uh, a week where your boy CJ scores 71 and not talk about it and yeah. and just tell me what you thought when you I, mean, I don't know if you saw the game or saw a replay or whatever but man that was crazy impressive i actually didn't watch the game i've seen some of the highlights before i went to bed because we were fresh off the road so i was just trying to get some time in with my son because i hadn't seen him in about 13 days so i checked my phone and i was like 41 and a half time i was like all right he's definitely getting 60 and then, you know, I would check in every now and then. I was like, okay, he's got 60. I was like, he he, he might get 70 if, if the game is close, like if they don't take him out. And as it progressed, he kept scoring. He he was hitting threes early, got to the free throw line, made his free throws. Um, he played a he played a really, really good game. He was aggressive throughout, efficient. And I joked, I said, you know, that that rest day he had when they got stuck on that plane, you know, really, you know, gave him what he needed uh to 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 show up and I actually talked to him last night and we was texting him um, because I know I'm going to be coming to be out in Portland soon. So I was just texting him, checking to see how everything was going. And he's like, yeah, I had to shoot every ball. (laughs) He's like, you know, it's that, it's that time of the year where a lot of guys are hurt, you know what I mean? On, on, on all teams, you know, you guys are going through it. We're going through it um, in New Orleans and, you know, he's playing without Nurk right now, without Anthony. Um, And the load is a little heavier and you got to figure out ways to try to win and be productive and, you know, he got it going. And I think that's just a testament to preparation, um, conditioning, right? Because it's hard to score throughout an entire game. And some people, you know, you as the saying goes, you blow your load in the first half and you don't really have nothing left in the second half. And I think he was able to sustain a, a certain level 
throughout the game where he was hot and he was consistent and I uh, was able to carry the load. But that's impressive, man. The score, 50 points is hard, but 60 and 70, you know, Don did it as well. We're seeing a, a huge uptick in, in points being scored and it's, it's, it's the way the game is kind of shifting with this, with the speed, the pace, the threes, and the ability to get to the free throw line. Grant, what do you do with that when you watch him? Like, what would you do with that if you see him pulling up from 40? Like, foul him? I was going to say, uh, there's not much you can really do when guys pull up from half court and consistently making it. Right. Uh, I laugh because um, I'm surprised you didn't say the Bron thing where you you you, you said he was going to have 70 that night. You predicted you got an idea, <laughs> a feeling that it was going to be 70 and 70. You really I just it. knew. I just knew he was going to score 70. We're still knew. doing that, huh? Oh, that's so good. <laughs> that's sick. My last thing before we let you go, we appreciate you coming on the pod. My dog's moving around again. Um, congratulations on uh, being voted in as the first uh, vice president. Thank Welcome. You Welcome. You already were a part of the committee, obviously. And now, you know, you've, you've joined an illustrious group of first vice presidents who have changed the game, made the game better, and continue to leave it uh, better than it was when we found it. So congratulations. And um, I'm hoping we can continue to help drive change uh, in this league and uh, make the game better than it was uh, when we found it. Thank you, brother. Hey, we're, I'm here for you, Press. Whatever you need from me, I'm, I'm here along the way. And uh, got to make sure that the players are taken care of now, but also players are taken care of 20 years down the line. Absolutely. Just, uh, for the podcast. For the podcast audience, can you explain this T-shirt for me? It says Hidden Village, and it's an anime character holding the Larry O'Brien. Yeah, so it's a Naruto uh, Hidden Village uh, shirt. It has it's holding the Larry O'Brien with the little sake on the bottom for celebration. And uh, it's one of my favorite uh, shows that I always watch. And I remember someone from the league, actually, Chris Chen, sent me this and said, hey, I know you're into anime. I'll send you these like shirts. He sent me one from One Piece and one from Naruto. And it's a great, it's a great uh, shirt. It's very comfortable. And it's also something that's super swag. I wore it to a game one time and got a little love from it. I don't know if you guys watch anime at all, but it definitely has its, its virtues. We don't, but we talked about it on here, how CJ's teammates watch it and he's confused by it. <laughs> it's basically like, I would just describe it as another show that you could tune into. It's, it's great stories. And it's a little bit more action based. Like there's a lot like some animes have like sports, others have like fighting. It's more like fictional where you have like center things. And it's a Japanese like manga. Like people always joke around saying they're cartoons, but like they're deeper stories than necessary cartoons would be. And it's super, super exciting. So if you ever have a chance, there's a couple of ones I can recommend that people really enjoy depending on what you enjoy watching. Like some people watch like a lot of uh, death documentaries. Obviously you can watch Death Note. Like there's a lot of different uh comparisons i'm gonna write that one down death note i am got a long plane ride coming on i might check it out it's serious the concept behind it is 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 pretty much your you get someone's name you can write it in a journal and some shit can happen so that's this is it's, it's a very uh, impressive uh okay. show people always start with it I will not watch, but I appreciate the recommendation. <laughs> hey, listen, you're, you're too busy, Prez. I understand, but hey, I know Zion will, will tell you best. Like Z Naruto. watches, he's watching all. He watches on the t- on the training table. I will be watching Snowfall, um, and I need to I need to start BMF. So I'll, I'll be I'll be locked in on that for the for the foreseeable future. Oh, trust me, I've already seen both. You got to hey, you got to pass time with something. See, so you might have that too many meetings. You might need to cancel some so you can watch some shows. I'm. Uh, I've been I've been chilling. I've been I've been chilling on the meeting tip. I've, CVA, that's it. That was that was the main focus this last uh, year and a half or whatever it's been. But appreciate you joining the podcast. Get you a nap in, brother. I got to get ready to get treatment before practice and a flight. Um, as always, you know what it is with me. Much love. Great, it's, always, it's always hard for people in Miami to like guys who wear Boston jerseys, but hopefully they'll listen to this uh, and and get some love for you because it's obvious. Nothing to hate there. Hey, much love, brother. <laughs> hey, listen, y'all, thank you for having me on. And uh, excited. Hopefully, we can do this again t- t- towards finals time and we can be, yeah, we can see each other in person. Sounds good. Yes, sir, brother. Yeah.